You want to track jihad, it's easy to get bored. It's always the same, it's all a big game, it's bloodshed for the Lord. But it has to be done, because we're under the gun. Silence, we cannot afford. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Robert Spencer here with another thrilling episode of This Week in Jihad. And our special guest this evening is Dr. David Wood, the scourge of jihadis. Welcome, David. Doc, I'm the Dr. Seuss of jihad. I do not <laughs> like jihad in a house. I don't like it with a mouse. I don't like it with a train. I do not like it in a rain. Do you like it with an ax? Do you like it <laughs> with some smacks? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That'll be it for this evening. Uh, no, uh, we have more jihad, ladies and gentlemen. I was talking to David before we started here tonight about how it is indeed always the same. All you need to do is change the dates, change the names, and then it's the same stuff. And so I'm thinking about maybe hiring some jugglers, maybe contacting Andrew Tate for some... Uh, some cam girls. We'll try to liven this up a little bit, but in the meantime, it's just us. So, welcome. Where do you want to start, David? Shall we start with our friend Tariq Ramadan? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point out, based on what you said, we we've talked about this before, and I made a I made a video a long time ago pointing out exactly what you said that you know all you have to do is change the names and the dates <clears throat> and the places, but it's the same stories over and over again. So. Uh, one day I just made a template video where I said, and there was another, uh, there was another terrorist attack today in, and then I paused it, right? Cause then I could just insert the name and uh, he, he killed. And then a, another pause where I could insert the number of victims and so on. And, uh, and then I could just, I could just use that over and over again. And all I had to do was sit down and say, uh, cobble 15 and just do that and could could use the exact same uh video over and over again for all these attacks yep allahu akbar he shouted he struck them in the neck anyway Tariq ramadan is in the news this may even be the Tariq ramadan edition of this week in jihad for those of you who are not familiar Tariq ramadan up until quite recently was one of the most famous and influential Muslims in the entire world. He was hailed all over the West as a reformer, as the Muslim Martin Luther. He was called a towering intellect by Time magazine. But that was really kind of a joke because when he was on Twitter, he would post all this deep thoughts, all these little cliches, and all his followers would say, wow, such wisdom. But it was like Hallmark greeting card stuff. Uh, but he was... Um, very much ce uh, celebrated. He was called one of the most seven most important innovators of the 21st century. That wait, was also wait, 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 wait. They called him innovators because that'd get him in trouble. In the yeah, that's circles. bida. Yes, that's true. But uh, they weren't thinking about that because they're kafirs. Uh, Time magazine. That was once again and on in the year 2000. Actually. They called him one of the most important religious innovators of the 21st century. And I think, wait a minute, 21st century had not happened yet in the year 2000. Yet they knew that he was going to be influential. He was named one of the most 100 most influential people in the world today. Foreign Policy magazine listed him as one of the 100 top global thinkers in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2012. But then what happened, David? He... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to say, all the stuff that you're saying is exactly everything I've ever heard about Tariq Ramadan. So I'm like, what? What did he do that Robert's about to call him out for? Because I have, I have no clue. Tariq Ramadan, David, uh, appeared at a courthouse in Geneva, Switzerland, this past week. I believe it was yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, Tuesday, May 16th, and he is facing charges of violent rape. And there are actually a large number, there is actually a large number of women who have now accused him of rape with extreme violence. Not only that, 
But one of the first of them, David, is a woman named Henda Ayari, who says that when she was with him in the hotel room, she was appalled at how uh, aggressive he was being and asked him why he thought he could do this. And he said, because you are not wearing a hijab. Well, <laughs> that's crazy. Now, where, why would he get the idea, David, that a woman not wearing the hijab could lawfully be raped? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you have that, you have that, uh, in the Quran, what is it? 33, 59, where, yes, it is. um, you wear the, you wear the hijab so that you won't be molested with the implication being that if you refuse to wear the hijab, you're basically asking to be molested. That's it. And so he actually gave direct confirmation of this in his response to Hinda Iyari. Hey, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead and finish this. Uh, Someone says I'm echoing. You're echoing. Let's see. What can we do about your echoing? Well, I'm going to say they're not complaining about you. So you could go ahead and finish this point. I'll keep quiet and then we can f fix the echo. David, it's because of the prophetic power of your words. And so yeah, you are does. echoing. It's kind of a voice of God effect. It but, makes me sound more majestic. Yeah. Now, the problem is that it says here sound levels and use echo cancellation. Now, I have checked that for you before, but right now it is not checkable. It's grayed out. Uh, make peace says I'm not echoing now. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Finish the story, Ramadan point, and then we'll, uh, we'll ask again if there's a problem. I could always, I could always like close out and call back it, call back in. Okay. But in any case, uh, he is accused of exceptional brutality and humiliation. One of the women who has accused him says he can be very, very violent, grabbing you very violently, expecting from you any sexual practice, and demanding it aggressively enough, and then it comes down again. But these moments are very difficult to live through. Now, many of these women in the first place came forward anonymously. Henda Ayari actually wrote a book about her ordeal where she does not name Tariq Ramadan. She calls him Zubair and says that he is a Muslim intellectual but does not go any farther with any identification. Uh, only after a considerable period of time did any of these women start naming Tariq Ramadan, and now they say that they have, several of them say that they have gotten threats, not only to themselves but their families also, have gotten threats, and it should be noted that Tariq Ramadan is the grandson of none other than Hassan al-Banna, founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. And so now we know where he learned it all. Well, it does seem to all kind of piece together, you know? It does seem to... One thing leads to another, and then there you are. Uh, so this, I think it's important to note that this is a guy who was hailed as a moderate. When I remember years ago, I would go through his writings and say, there's nothing moderate about this. He's not calling for any actual reform in Sharia. He's not calling for any, any uh, diminishment of the Hudud punishments, the, the punishments for, for, for various uh, particular crimes that are uh, prescribed in the Quran. Like the the and the or the or in the Sunnah, like the stoning for adultery or the amputation for theft, he wasn't calling for any mitigation of any of that. He only called for them not to be introduced into Europe right away, which of course stands to reason because they don't have Muslim majorities in Europe at this point, not yet. And so he's always been accused of duplicity, and it seems like uh, there were a lot of people who were so anxious to find a moderate so intent on finding somebody who seemed to be a counterweight to the jihadis that they gave him the benefit of the doubt. And uh, also, you know what's remarkable about giving him the benefit of the doubt, David? i got to tell you one other thing here. Uh, let me find it. This, uh, this behavior, this remarkable, revolting behavior that he's accused of now seems to have been known for quite some time. 
there is a French intellectual named Bernard Godard, Bernard Goddard, Bernard Godard. And he is known as Monsieur Islam at the French Ministry of Interior. He's the advisor on Islam to the French government. And he, after Ramadan was arrested, he said, Ramadan had many mistresses. He consulted sites. Girls were brought to the hotel at the end of his lectures. He invited them to undress. Some resisted, and he could become violent and aggressive. Yes, but I've never heard of rapes. I'm stunned. So they, they knew all that, and let, yet gave him a pass and still hailed him because, well, the general Western intelligentsia is so intent on finding moderates that they were able to, they, they turn, the, turn the other way with this guy. Yeah, it seems like one of the, like the Harvey Weinstein situation where everyone knows what's going mm -hmm. on, but no one wants to call him out. No one wants to be the one to call him out because then, you know, you're the, you're the bad guy who ruined the, uh, the cash cow. Yep. And yeah, a lot, I mean, a, a lot of the reformers that, you know, so-called <clears throat> reformers that we see over the years, it, it all seems like a, it, it always seems like an act that eventually gets exposed, you know? Yes. Like with care and so on. You, you, it, it, it's a, it, it, it looks like an act to us. The media still run with it always. You see how wonderful this is? Oh, it's so peaceful. <laughs> and then it eventually, it eventually unravels. It's incredible. You know something else? Qatar, which is the country that is the center for the Muslim Brotherhood globally today, uh, has made sure that he was released from prison when he was originally arrested several years ago, and that he was able to live at home, and they've been paying him $40,000 a month. $40,000 a month, and to do what? See, he was dismissed from his professor job, but the government of Qatar is paying him just to be Tariq Ramadan, forty grand a month. I think for that money, I'll be Tariq Ramadan. But I'll I'll totally be Tariq Ramadan right now. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go on raping a bunch of people, but uh, yeah, I can do the rest. I can do the oh, it's love so wonderful. I can do that. Yeah. So uh, if you're listening in Doha, well, we're available. <laughs> we're, we're, you know. Right here, the, the Ramadan brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he actually has a brother, Hani Ramadan, who is uh, quite, a lot, quite a bit less deceptive than Tariq. Tariq has been posing as a moderate all this time, while his brother, who is also in Switzerland, uh, is an imam who has openly called for Sharia and defended the Hadood punishments and all of that. He, and so... They're kind of a good cop, bad cop duo, but they really don't have any serious disagreements, if any at all. Yeah, and, and here, here's, the, uh, here's the problem with all this reform. The Western media uh, institutions, uh, politicians, every educators, they'll all point to anyone who they view as a moderate and say, you see, this is real Islam. And all the people shouting Allahu Akbar, um, that, that's, a, that's some misunderstanding of it. Um, but with all these reformers, again, it, it usually comes out as, a, as, an, as some kind of show or act meant to deceive a bunch of Western morons. Um, but even if it doesn't, even, suppose, suppose Tariq Ramadan was the most sincere reformer in the history of Islam. <laughs> Who's more, who's more popular, him or like an Ali Dawa, who's screaming about how as soon as he gets in power, he's going to execute a, ex, he's going to execute former Muslims. Good point. And 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 that's the point you take. Even if you had a sincere reformer, they're just they never they never gain traction with anyone except Western politicians and journalists and so on. They don't they don't influence the Muslim community. The people influencing the Muslim community are. Uh, Ali Dawa, Muhammad Hijab, Daniel Hakikachu, who's uh, being praised for his brilliant intellectual defense of child marriage. Uh, these are the guys. These are the guys who are becoming massively popular. And so it's like, okay, media, <laughs> hey, journalists, you're praising this guy, 
this guy for his views. No one's listening to that guy. No yeah. one cares about that guy. Why are you propping him up? And guess what? Maybe they're thinking like, oh, if we, the media, prop this guy up, then his peaceful, tolerant views will spread. They're still under the assumption that when, you know, you've got someone who uh, is raised as a Muslim or converts to Islam, and they still think that that person is, is thinking, hmm, now how do I live as a Muslim? Let me go to CNN. Let me ask CNN. CNN, what do you have? Oh, you're playing Tariq Ramadan? Oh, okay. I guess I'll get my information about Islam from that and not from Islam's most trusted sources or uh, our most popular da'is or our best sheikhs. Not from any of that. I go to CNN. It, it's like it's like it delusional. Yep. You know, David, that actually brings up another important point, and that is that Tariq Ramadan is in every sense yesterday's man. Uh, he has not been, because he's been under the cloud of these accusations and charges for the last few years, he has not been in the public eye. But it's also true that the approach he represents has passed from the scene. He dates from a time, he had his heyday in a time when Muslim leaders in the West, of which he was a quintessential example, tried to make Westerners think that Islam was completely compatible with Western values and mores. And his whole public career has been about fooling Westerners into thinking that Sharia is completely compatible with Western secular government and laws, and that there's nothing to be concerned about, therefore, with mass Muslim migration into Europe and North America and so on. Now, the people that you mentioned a minute ago, like Ali Dawa and Hikikaju, they all represent, I think, a new wave of Muslims in the West who defiantly and openly and proudly reject the Tariq Ramadan idea that they have to say, hey, this is all benign, you don't have to worry about it. They say, actually, yes, it's completely incompatible with Western secular mores. And you should be worried about it, and we're going to conquer and subjugate you. Correct? Yeah, uh, but when you said uh, Hakikachu, it sounded like he'll kick a Jew. <laughs> I bet he I would. Thought, and I think, yeah, I thought, yeah, he probably would. <laughs> and, probably, and, then, and, and then offer a, a series of studies that he's found that promote the, the community benefits of, of kicking. <laughs> yeah. <kicking. laughs> and challenge challenge non-Muslims on our hypocrisy for not joining in. Hey, has anyone heard that as a, as a nickname for him? Because they, they call him Pikachu and stuff like that. I usually don't get into the silly names and stuff like that, but uh, he'll kick a Jew. That's, that's almost like a... Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's right there. Yeah. That's practically his name I'm, already. I'm, 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 assume, I'm assuming people have come up with that before, but I hadn't heard it. I don't know. Does he, uh, does he do a lot of anti-Semitic stuff? Probably uh, he would if... Uh, if it came up no he's more he's more uh uh anti like lgbtq stuff and and promoting wife beating and child marriage and stuff charming so he, I, I, if i based on the little i've seen he wants christians and jews to unite with muslims around these causes of uh, wife beating and child marriage and uh slaughtering lgbtq people and so on well, you know, that's kind of ludicrous, but it is worth noting at the, uh, in connection with that that there are a lot of Christians at this point who are very happy watching Muslims being angry about all the transgender business and all that and thinking that they can make alliances with Islamic groups. And I think, well, that, that's understandable, but they don't realize the pitfalls involved. David, maybe you could briefly go over some of those pitfalls. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it's the it's the old it's the old line. You, you, you if you're sick, uh, whatever you're taking for the cure shouldn't be worse than the disease. You know what I mean? Uh, so any problem you're pointing out to in society and thinking, oh, Islam can help solve this. Islam is something worse, my friends. It's like it's like saying, oh no, man, I gotta. Ah, I, I smashed my, my pinky nail. What am I going to do about this? Oh, I know. I'll stab myself in the face with a rusty screwdriver and I'll forget all about that pinky nail. Well, yeah, that would work. 
That would make my, my pinky nail seem like a, an insignificant problem, but only by stabbing myself in the face with a rusty screwdriver, which is worse than, you know, a problem with a fingernail or something like that. And uh, so, yeah, any problem you can think of in the West um, that you want to do something about, because th th there, are, there are massive problems in the West. Uh, Islam has never been the solution to anything. Um, so yeah, and that's, that's bad, but, and keep in mind the people who would want to unite with you, the, the, the people, the Muslims who would want to find allies and so on, uh, these are the same people who are united with, who are united with the extreme left for decades now, um, because they, they viewed the left as the ones who would protect Muhammad from criticism. Oh, now you want to teach our, our kids trans stuff. Okay, now we're going to be now we're going to be right. Now we're going to be now we're going to be hard right. It's like, wait, you're just picking on what whatever you think is is going to help you with whatever agenda is at the top of your list for the moment. But you have no you have no loyalty to any of these any of these other groups beyond that. And so, uh, yeah, they would uh, they would definitely uh, love to form alliances with other groups to work on something that they've um, that, that they're concerned about. But they're also going to insist, hey, if we're going to get along, you can't be criticizing Muhammad now. Hey, you want us on your team? You want us on your team against these, you know, this trans stuff? We'll be on your team, but you can't be criticizing Muhammad. That, 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 will, that will break the alliance and then people will go along with it. And suddenly, uh, yeah, suddenly you'll have like conservatives and, and Christians and Jews and everyone all united. Oh, we can't criticize Muhammad. He's so great. Mm -hmm. And it's like, guys, don't, don't fall for that nonsense. A lot of this yeah. comes from them not knowing that uh, American conservatives not having any idea what Islam is all about. And so they think, well, yes, there are these terrorists and so on, but then there are all these other nice guys, and they seem to be on our side, so full speed ahead. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, guys, uh, I mean, I've never been much of a group joiner, right? I'm a Christian. Other than that, find a group that I'm a part of. Uh, one of the problems I have with uh, signing on to some group is that they're going to now expect you to adopt all the views of that group. And there just aren't a lot of gr groups out there that I would say I, I agree with them on on everything. But you're expected to fall into line uh, on all these things. And it's the same thing with alliances. If I form an alliance and say, OK, uh, we're forming an alliance with Islam now. Well, now they're going to be rules. Uh, you, you all have to be in in uh, in, in some sort of agreement that you're not going to say things that offend your allies. And therefore, we wouldn't be allowed to say the things that, that need to be said about Islam. So uh, my view is, look, uh, there are things that I will agree with Muslims on. Uh, if, Muslim, if a Muslim says, hey, the universe was created, guess what? I agree the universe was created. I, I, I'm not going to disagree with him just because he's a Muslim. Um, so anything that I happen to agree with a Muslim on, great. I agree with you on that. We have that bit of shared common ground but that common ground does not mean i don't have a problem with you know all the child marriage and slaughtering unbelievers in the name of allah and killing apostates and everything else in in your religion so uh yeah anytime you want to chat and see what we agree on that's fine but i'm not stopping criticizing this stuff ever and it also must be noted that the muslim side will never treat non-muslims as equals uh, in some kind of an ongoing culture war partnership. It'll never happen because there is no possibility for non-Muslims to be treated as equals within Islamic teaching. Therefore, the alliance will only go, in so, go so far as it will remain useful for the Muslims, and then the allies will be dropped as soon as they stop being useful. And we, you, you, that's the exact pattern you have in the life of Muhammad, who was their pattern of conduct, right? Muhammad was happy to form alliances when they were convenient against some other group that he was focusing on. Later on, he would then subjugate those groups as well. Um, so so in, other, in other words, when Muhammad is the persecuted prophet in Mecca and he's surrounded by polytheists, um, he's, he's, he's telling Jews and Christians, hey, Jews, Christians, we're, we're all on the same side here. It's these polytheists who are the problem. Uh, and then when he went to Medina, of course, wanted to form these alliances with the Jews, the Jewish tribes, of course, uh, then he uh, either expelled or exterminated all of those eventually. Um, same thing with, with the Christians. Okay, now it's the Christians who are, who are closest in love to the Muslims. 
yeah, go, go a couple chapters later, fight those who do not believe in Allah uh, from among the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. But you can look at all these tribes and different groups that he formed alliances. They all eventually had to be subjugated, all of them. So just keep in mind, anyone who's, hey, we can, we can form alliances with our Muslim friends to stop trans boys. I don't, I don't even know what the correct <laughs> trans. It changes so often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still confused about the language. But this, a, a trans girl racing against uh, a biological girl, we need to stop that. And therefore, we're going to form alliances with people who will gladly form a temporary alliance with us with the goal of eventually subjugating us after uh, getting rid of that other problem they want to they get rid of. Yep. All right. I think that uh, at this point, David, we've got a lot of stupid infidel stories. And since we've been dealing with stupid infidels all this time, we'll just go on. In Denmark, a 15-year-old named Ahmad Talal Hawila he brutally assaulted another 15-year-old, stabbed him in the right side of the back, and slashed him in the back of the head. It seems as if what he wanted to do was cut off his head or strike his neck, as we have noted so many times, in accord with the Quran's command, when you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. He has just been convicted of attempted murder, and David, he was given a four-year prison sentence. Four years for attempted murder, plus a warning that if he keeps this sort of thing up, he might be deported. That's a, uh, I'm sure he's going to learn his lesson. <laughs> yes, of course, as they always do in prison. Yeah, they, I mean, you know, for something like that, if it's four years for attempted murder or something <laughs> like that, you're basically... As the uh, as the legal system, you're thinking, oh, we're gonna go, we're gonna be really nice here, really gentle, and his heart's going to melt, ah. and he's gonna become a better person. Oh yeah, that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, uh, I've got um, one. I want to show the picture here. Let me get the picture going here. Um, we have David in this picture. We have Shaquille Hussein. He's on the right. Shaquille Hussein, he won a seat on the Borough Council of Stockton on Tees. That's in Britain, as you probably realized already, because they have names like Stockton on Tees. Yeah, they, got that. they love those stupid names over there. <laughs> and this is one of his buddies who looks pretty Salafi to me. And mm -hmm. anyway, Shaquille Hussein was elected from the Conservative Party to the Borough Council of Stockton on Tees. And then it came out that he had said a lot of anti Semitic things. Unbelievable. The, I know the, I, yeah. I never would have I never would have guessed it. Even though I've seen the exact same thing happen thousands of times where, oh look, here's the new champion of uh, tolerance and moderation. <laughs> Just don't look at his Twitter page from three years ago. I've only seen that thousands and thousands of times, but uh, yeah, it's still shocking every time I hear it every day. Yep. So the conservatives, they were shocked because, of course, they know nothing whatsoever about Islam. They have been told that anybody who tells them about Islam are just Islamophobes and so on. Hey, wait a minute now. Okay, I've got to, I've got to digress here for a minute. Because we have this gentleman here saying, Robert and David don't seem to address the existence of Mo or the reality of Mecca being the place of Islam's I, origin. I, 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 quick, quick, quick question, Robert. Uh, one, haven't you written an entire book on that topic? And yes. two, didn't we debate each other on that topic? And, and three, yes. <laughs> didn't, the, didn't the two of us together debate two Muslims on that topic? It seems like we have addressed it quite a bit uh yeah. what's he mean what's he mean we don't we don't address it when we're talking about the latest news in jihad yeah there's Apparently, a yeah, we're not yeah. we're not yeah we're not covering basic uh addition in, in this either or, or we're, we're not covering a basic biology here either we're uh we're covering what, what's the topic this week in jihad yeah. that's what we're covering 
Yeah, you can get my book, Rob, Did Muhammad Exist? It's called. It's available wherever fine books are sold. And also, I'm pretty sure, I haven't looked in years, but I'm pretty sure that the debate that uh, David and I had on this many years ago is still on YouTube. And the debate that we had with Anjum Chowdhury and Omar Bakri on the same topic is also there. I think it's there. Uh I believe that one that one was taken down at some point. I think they scrubbed. I'm not sure whether it was because of Omar Bakri or because of Anjum Chowdhury, but they went on a scrubbing spree. Uh, well, yeah, in any case, down. the one David and I did should be there. And uh, I have the book, Did Muhammad Exist? David also debated Jay Smith on this issue. So this is something that we've spent quite a lot of time on. Uh, and David, anytime you want to do another round with the... Uh, the does ex revised expanded edition of Did Muhammad Exist? Just say the word. It I'll be, be happy to. I'll be happy to crush you. Ali Frazier, number two. <laughs> hey, someone's still saying echo, although uh, not a lot of people complaining. Um, guys, if uh, if this doesn't fix it, there's just nothing we could do without troubleshooting, which you can't do in the middle of a live stream, right? So I'm just going to hang up and call back real quick and see if that uh, that helps at all. Okay. Uh, Ladies right, and gentlemen. So you can, you all can talk amongst yourselves for a minute? Yeah, ask me anything, ladies and gentlemen. If you have anything to ask me, just ask away in that uh, comment thingy. But otherwise, I will talk. Why not? That's what we're here for. Uh, we have some stupid infidel stories. For example, another one coming out of Denmark was the uh, Muhammad cartoons. And there was a proposal in Denmark for the teaching about the Muhammad cartoons to be made a part of the regular curriculum. And that would be in order to teach the Danes, great or not, about the freedom of speech and about the necessity for the freedom of speech as the foundation of any free society. But the proposal was voted down. The Danes thought that it would cause too many riots, too much difficulty for the people should they talk too much about freedom of expression. And that means freedom of expression is on its way out. Let's see how this works. David, let's see. Where's, where is David? David, you with us? Whoops. It looks like you're the only one here. Um, Uh-oh. Now I'm on the wrong side. <laughs> you're far right now. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what they always say. How strange. Okay. Well, I'm just going to be on the far right. Anyway, I uh, hope the sound is better. David, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. Um, basically, we're not fixing anything else uh, right now. I'll have to go and listen to it later to see if we can spot the problem. Someone said it, it just sounds like a, 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 an echo coming from the uh, uh, headphones or something like that. So, I got an interesting proposal here. What do you think about this idea, Mr. Spencer? You to make animations about the most embarrassing, hilarious, and also cruel moments of Muhammad's life. I'll tell you something, uh, crowdfunding for that, that, that's great, although I'm banned from GoFundMe because I'm such a terrible guy. They don't like uh, foes of jihad terror. And uh, in any case, then there would be the problem of finding animators. I don't know anything about animation. Do you know anything about animation, David? Zero. So that being the case, uh, <laughs> that being the case, it would be tough. I can tell you that I spoke. I guess I'm just going to have to live with being on this side. I have to turn, turn this way now. Um, I spoke a few years ago, many years ago, actually, to a very famous Hollywood film director. I don't want to embarrass him by naming him, but I happened to be at a function sitting next to him. And so I gave him an idea. How, how about you do a movie about Muhammad? It's a great cinematic possibility because the guy's life is full of adventurous stories, dramatic incidents. There's a lot of brutality. There's a lot of sex. 
There's everything that makes movies sell. And I could write the screenplay. I already wrote the book. And he got very nervous and sort mm -hmm. of laughed nervously and said that uh, he wanted to, he valued his life. And that was it. You know, people are afraid to deal with these issues. And that's why there's never been a movie about Muhammad, except the most ridiculous hagiographical thing where Muhammad is the camera and you can't see him. Because, of course, to see him would provoke idolatry. <laughs> there, is the, uh, there is the possibility of uh, crowdfunding some sort of project. Yeah, you can't do it as a Hollywood movie. But uh, the ideas I have are, uh, one, claymation. Do a, do a claymation mm. Life of Muhammad that's like two hours long. And uh, I would think I can do all the voices. Be kind of like Mr. Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly like that, right? Yeah. Uh, so that, that sort of claymation. Or the Lego stop motion uh, animation mm -hmm. where they use little Lego figures to go around doing everything. Mm -hmm. um, there's that, or just make it like kind of low budget Monty Python and the Holy Grail ish, but like life of Muhammad, but that kind of, that kind of style. Um, yeah. It could so be huge. One of the, one of those ideas would work. Well, let me know. I'm happy to help. All right. Uh, I did a story very briefly while you're not here, but David, when you're not here, and I'm just telling the stories, it's boring. So this is this is part of the problem here. The jihad stories are all the same. Spencer's dull. What are you going to do, man? Anyway, um, let's go to Sweden. In Sweden, there was a fellow. What's his name here? Um, oh, oh, Malin. No, that's not his name. His name doesn't seem to be in here. It just is a representative of the Muslim group called Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd. And they're in the city of Malmo, which of course has a very large Muslim population. <clears throat> now this group, Ibn Rushd, already gets the uh, taxpayer funding. But this guy, they were going to have a party for Eid, the, fe the feast at the end of Ramadan. And... This guy said that there was not enough taxpayer funding for their Eid party, and that if they didn't, the city didn't come across with more funds, Muslims would riot. What do you think, David? Where does he get that idea? Um, it, it's got to be from like Islamophobes like you. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a guy years ago, he said, he, I, I couldn't believe this. I was reading along. He, he sent me this lengthy screed. And in the middle of it, he says, in Gaza, they are rioting and sending rockets into Israel because they read Spencer and they think they have a duty to jihad. I think, are you serious? Do you, you, you think I made that up? Yeah, that, that ranks right up there. I mean, that, that's, that's along the same lines as uh, thinking that these guys... Like the, the nice Muslims get their get their information about Islam from CNN and then the radical, uh, violent extremists, they get their uh, views on Islam from Robert Spencer. But wh whatever happens, the Muslim sources never have anything to do with Islam. Nothing. Nothing. Islam has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, meanwhile, we have another question here that is very salient and important. I'm actually mm. ready to make an announcement here, ladies and gentlemen, because I did ask you several weeks or months ago for suggestions about a book, and I've been in consultation with my publisher, Bombardier Books. And anyway, the question here is, when is the Critical Sierra coming out? Next year. That's right. I have signed a contract, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the first global announcement. I have signed a contract with Bombardier Books to write a book called Muhammad, a critical biography, to be a companion piece to the critical Quran. It will be, in a certain sense, a, the sequel to my earlier biography of Muhammad, The Truth About Muhammad, as well as a, uh, an application of a lot of the investigations of Did Muhammad Exist? So not only will we be telling the story of Muhammad in Muhammad, a critical biography, but also examining when the stories were told and in what circumstances and trying to elucidate why these stories were invented and 
what Muhammad was invented for, and so on. And so maybe then uh, we can do the debate, David, when that book comes out, The Thrilla in yeah. Manila, Part 3. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to crush you in, in, in that debate. Um, <laughs> hey, you, uh, you should check out Joshua Little's uh, doctoral dissertation. Yeah, I've seen that briefly. But yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm going to be discussing. And so this question, how will the book be any different from the truth about Muhammad? Because it's going to be examining these stories from the historical critical standpoint and looking at, I think Joshua Little actually is an extraordinarily interesting and important figure because mm -hmm. he is somebody who is trying to make a distinction in the Islamic literature between material that is... It, it, among material that's all considered authentic by Islamic scholars and trying to argue that some of it is actually inauthentic and some of it is authentic. And so uh, that's going to be quite different from the truth about Muhammad, which just presents the Sira material. And it's going to evaluate whether it's even possible to determine if any of the Sira literature has greater historical value than some of the others. But can you, what, what about Dave, uh, Joshua Little, David? Um, what is unusual about what he's doing? Well, I mean, he's pointed out in some of his talks that there, there hasn't, there just hasn't been a lot of, a, a lot of work by non-Muslim Western scholars on the Hadith. They say there's tons of people go into Quran studies, but very few people who go into Hadith studies he said it's actually an area where it's one of the few areas where you can go into and actually learn everything that's been written on a topic. Mm -hmm. um, like I did my doctoral dissertation on the Bayesian argument from evil. Uh, one of the reasons I picked that was that was a recent argument. And I realized I could actually read everything that's been written on this. I could go through all of the philosophers who defend it and everyone who's responded to them. And I can actually know everything about a topic. Uh, so he's pointing out that that Hadith studies is actually uh, like that, but um, I, I'll put it. I'll put it like this. Uh, thinking of so, he, in his dissertation, he's ultimately arguing that we don't know how how old Aisha was. But he and so I've seen Muslims using that. See, we don't know how old Aisha was, and so on. He gets to that conclusion because he treats the sources as very, very unreliable, and he's come up with methods for for trying to to pinpoint an, an origin, like when is the earliest you can you can date this back to and things like that. Uh, but using like computer computer models where he'll take like 200 sources and then compare the Asnads and all the, all the names in the Asnads and then compare all the uh, different bits of information and phrases that are contained in the, the Matan, the, so that's the mm -hmm. actual content of the Hadith. And he'll line them up and it actually, you can, it starts tracing things back to historical points of when you can say the story originates, but uh, he wreaks havoc on the reliability of hadiths in general. So, so anyway, so the, the sort of takeaway, so that his conclusion, the whole thing is, is meant to lead up to a conclusion about not knowing how old uh, Aisha was. But uh, to get there, he has to basically destroy the Sunni Orthodox method of determining the reliability of hadiths because you've got hundreds of hadiths on the age of Aisha. So to argue that they're all wrong, you 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 got to do something. You got to say these sources have a problem. But uh, uh, Robert, so, I mean, since we're talking about this, just let me read you a little bit of what he says about the hadiths here, just to give you an idea, since you're you're going to be uh, checking all this out. Mm -hmm. um, but so chapter one, this is the beginning of chapter one of his book. This is Methods and Debates. And he says that hadith are unreliable, that any given matan cannot be taken at face value as an accurate datum from the first Islamic century, and that any given isnad cannot be taken at face value as an accurate record of a matan's provenance, provenance cannot be seriously contested for multiple reasons. And then his first reason is Jews, Christians, and Muslims during this time were all fabricating sources. And then he says, secondly, there is the high frequency of contradictions within the Hadith corpus, which necessitates the occurrence of a huge amount of fabrication, interpolation, and or mutation, and therefore skepticism towards any given Hadith. Thirdly, there is the ubiquity of fabrication and interpolation, both reported and demonstrable, in the hadith corpus which again casts doubt upon the rest of the corpus 
Fourthly, there is the rapid extreme mutation and growth of reports that evidently took place over the course of a century or more of oral transmission, which means that any given matin, regardless of the isnad, is likely at best heavily distorted and at worst obliterated beyond its original form. So he just, he keeps going on with that about what an epic disaster these sources are. So anyways, this is the, the summary is this. You can think of how skeptical you are of the Hadith. Let's say there's a scale of one to 10 uh, and your average Orthodox Sunni Muslim, his skepticism about let's say Sahih al-Bukhari is basically a one. Yeah, if, so, if he finds something that contradicts the Quran or something, he'll throw that up. But other than that, he's gonna take this stuff as, as pretty uh, good as gold, right? So skepticism level would be like a one. Um, my skepticism level of the hadith would be like a, a like a four or five range meaning if i have reason to think okay that's odd, like a miracle stories and so on i'm not i'm not saying they're made up because they're miracle stories i'm saying they're made up because the quran is the earliest source on that and the quran repeatedly denies that muhammad could perform miracles but the quran is is pointing out that people were repeatedly cha challenging muhammad to perform miracles and allah is making excuses for him so it's pretty clear that, that didn't stop when Muhammad died. People would have still kept asking for the miracle stories. And lo and behold, you got a bunch of them in Bukhari. Muhammad's performing miracles. Okay, those are clearly those are clearly made up later. So uh, for me, I look at it like if I have a reason to doubt the story, if something looks suspicious, then I won't trust it. If, if, I, if I don't have a reason to be suspicious about it, then I'll treat it as, as reliable information. So it's like a four or five. Then like you and Jay Smith, your skepticism level is like about a 10. It's like, okay, this is we can't trust any of these guys. Maybe you can trust them for information they're giving about stuff that happened later. But as far as the, the, the life of Muhammad, you guys, you're, you're treating this stuff as really, really, really bad. So then I go reading through his summary of the positions of the Western Hadith scholars, their skepticism level seems to be in the eight to nine range. So significantly more skeptical than I am. They seem to believe that they can get to some kernels of truth in this material. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, in my debate with Kenny Bomer, I compared it to, uh, it sounds like they view it like, like walking through a garbage dump, right? You're in a garbage dump. You're on a big pile of garbage. Can you find something useful in that garbage dump? Yes, you can find, oh, look, a toothbrush. I can use that, right? You can find stuff, uh, but it's still, it's, it's, you're finding it by rooting around through garbage. So in his dissertation, he, has, he spends a ton of time bringing people up to date on the, on the latest, uh, the latest uh, view of hadiths among scholars. And it is, it is not good. They wreak havoc, they wreak havoc on that. And it's just, so it's just interesting that this guy views himself as combating Islamophobia by taking away the Aisha objection. But in the process, he's only protecting them from the Aisha criticism by destroying the foundations of Sunni Islam. And so I look yep. at that and I go, amen, brother Little, do it. Yeah. <laughs> do it. You I, protect all uh, you protect all these guys from me and my criticisms of Aisha, but do it by completely destroying the foundations of Sunni Islam. I'm I'm with you. And the apologists don't even seem to realize. You know, uh, that's what is amazing to me. I've been seeing these guys citing Joshua Little. I see that Joshua Little essentially agrees with me entirely in regard to the reliability of the Hadith and the arguments that I set out in Did Muhammad Exist? But the arguments in Did Muhammad Exist destroy the figure of Muhammad altogether and show that he's more legend than fact. And so in order to protect themselves against the child marriage of Muhammad, these apologists who are citing little are cutting off the branch they're sitting on, mm -hmm. and they're going to end up destroying their entire faith. But they don't even realize that. So anyway, yes, this is the kind of thing I'm going to be discussing at great length and detail in Muhammad, a critical biography. I've just started writing it. I got to turn it in in December, so it's going to take the balance of this year, and then it'll be out sometime next year, God willing. Anyway, David, uh, it is now almost 10 to the hour, and we yeah, have you've, barely you've, you've, done any you've, jihad. So. Yeah, you've ruined this entire week of jihad by all these digressions. Yeah, well, you know, I started out Talk by saying it's the same old story all the time. So this week, <laughs> it's a little different. But uh, let's go through very quickly 
some of the actual jihad activity uh, in Spain. We had a uh, political rally of an anti-immigrant conservative Catholic party and a Moroccan Muslim migrant came to the uh, rally and attacked a woman, a politician, who is with this party and threw a porcelain figure at her, hitting her in the back, and also attacked the party's van. And uh, he said, They want to take away our aid. Whoever I catch on the street, I'll rip off his head. Now, that's certainly going to make people be in favor of mass Muslim migration, is it not, David? Yeah, yeah. makes me that way. In Sudan, we had the Mar Girgis St. George Church in Omdurman, and uh, a group of paramilitary forces went there during Mass on Sunday morning, church full of people, and opened fire. And they injured a number of people, caused a panic at the church. And of course, that is part of the stepping up of persecution of Christians in Sudan as the unrest there continues. In Uganda, we had Shakuru Undifuna. And Shakuru Undifuna was an Islamic teacher, David. He taught Islam. But he uh, went to a, an evangelistic event intending to argue with the Christians in Namutumba in Uganda, near Iganga. And <coughs> he, <coughs> excuse me, he ended up converting to Christianity. You see, Allah yes. has spoken. <laughs> he cursed the infidel with a cough. <clears throat> Yes, and then gave the infidel water. So Shakuru Ndifuna converted to Christianity, and then his old friends that he used to teach Islam to came and beat him unconscious and threatened his life. Why did they do that, David? Surely they misunderstood Islam. I mean, you'd have to misunderstand Islam, because which part of no <laughs> compulsion in religion didn't you understand? <laughs> but of course there is the death penalty for apostasy, and so Shakuru Ndifuna is still in grave danger. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, Muslims ambushed a key crossroads, killing three people, burning cars and motorcycles, and destroying a makeshift water reservoir, overpowering the security officers, once again showing that the jihad forces in a lot of these areas in Africa are stronger than the government forces. Why might that be? Why are they so popular, David? Aren't they hijacking I, I, and twisting the religion of peace? I, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's, yeah, they, I don't know, man. What's up with these reformers? No one, no one wants to agree with them except the people on the other side. Isn't that weird? It's very strange. It, it's super strange, especially when you, you know, you consider that, you know, in, in verses like Surah 4, verse 65, Muslims are told you're not a real Muslim unless you submit to everything Muhammad has said. Um, if you don't submit to, in fact, the, the verse says that if you find any resistance in yourself against anything Muhammad has said, you're not a real Muslim. <laughs> and then you've got in the Hadith, Muhammad issuing all these warnings against innovation, saying if you're an innovator, if you try to come up with your own version of Islam or a, 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 your own version of any one of these teachings, that is a one-way ticket to hell. And then a reformer got, steps up and says, hey, I've got a better version of Islam, and no one listens to him except CNN, and uh, they, we can't figure out why. Yep. Why indeed? It's the eternal question. Matthew King, David, 19 years old, young man in Britain, and he decided to convert to Islam. Now, oddly enough, after Matthew converted to Islam, he began discussing with an online girlfriend plans to massacre British police officers or soldiers. But his mom turned, turned him in. Spoiled his plans. Mom! Anyway... Why would a convert, David, get the strange idea that he should wage war against unbelievers and try to kill cops? 
<laughs> I don't know. He, he, he had to have been watching your stuff, Robert. That's the only possible explanation. There's, there's no other possible explanation. All right, uh, Nigeria. 28 people killed in a jihad raid on the Umbawa Council Ward in the Guma local government area of Benway State. 28 people killed. Soldiers and police stood by and did nothing. Uh, increasing charges from non-Muslims in Nigeria that the government is on the side of the jihadis and is supporting the jihad. In Syria, in Idlib, Sheikh Mahmoud al hubesh preached a sermon last Friday. Actually, it was a little bit earlier, but it was reported just a few days ago. And he said this, The Jews are the enemies of Allah. They violate the agreements they make. Two things are mutually exclusive, Jews and agreements. They mutually contradict each other. Parallel lines that never intersect. Allah says, for the breaking of their covenant, we curse them. We And so he says, if the Jews attack you and you confront those wanton infidels, those descendants of apes, you will be washing the shame that covers a nation of one billion people. From this liberated land of jihad, we say to you, we are ready to sacrifice our lives for you. Do not fear the Jews. Where does he get this? This sounds a little anti-Semitic, David. Surely this has nothing to do with Islam, the religion of tolerance. No, no, no. In Islam, it's uh, all, all the people of the all the people of the book are good. I heard from CNN. <laughs> yep. So we have a mother, a Hamas mom, the mother of Hassan Katanani, who murdered a British Israeli woman named Lucy D in a shooting attack in April, and uh, his mom is now doing the circuit on the television channels that uh, Hamas runs, and she says he loved martyrdom. He would say to me day and night, Mom, I want to be martyred. He would kiss my hand and say, Pray to Allah that I will be martyred. Praise be to Allah for granting him what he wanted. We cannot accept what the Jews did to us. We should fight them with our children, with our money, with our families, with our fingernails. We should devour the Jews with our teeth. The Jews are our enemy from beginning to end. Surely that does that must not be representative of Islam, is it, David? Devour um, the Jews with our teeth? Yeah, well, uh, now that I think about it, I do recall some passages in the uh, Quran and the Hadith that are uh, dealing with this, of course, you know, in Surah 5, where Allah says that the most vehement of uh, enemies to the believers are the Jews and the polytheists, uh, you have Muhammad in the Hadith saying that the end will not come until you fight the Jews, until the Jews are hiding behind rocks and trees, and the rocks and trees are crying out, hey, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come kill him. Uh, so you have those kinds of, uh, you have those kinds of passages. What, what's, what's especially creepy is this, um, uh, this desire to send their kids out. Right, this I, I want my kid to go be a martyr. And then you, you, you see the kid's obsession with martyrdom. Where is he getting that? Well, he's being fed on a steady diet of Muhammad, who said in the Hadith that uh, that he that if you had the entire world, it would not compare. It would not compare to the glory you get from being a martyr. Uh, Muhammad said uh, that his greatest desire was to be martyred, to be killed while slaughtering unbelievers in the name of Allah. Uh, he said that it's the greatest thing in the world. He was asked, "What? What's the?" Uh, what is what deed is greater than that? He said, I do not find such a deed. And so it's the greatest thing you could do. You get rewarded with all your uh, all your virgins in paradise. You get to spend eternity deflowering virgins. And then it's combined with this. Uh, it's combined with this uh, with this weird. I don't know. I, I guess it's always been here. But have you noticed that like everyone's what? Well, let me let me let me let me let me wind this back. In the ancient world, when they still had things, you know, when they're still doing ritual sacrifice and so on, the the value of your your sacrifice is what demonstrated your uh, your devotion to your God. And so, the greatest thing that they could sacrifice was their children. Right? That's how you really showed your pagan God uh, how much you 
uh, loved him or loved her. Now notice in, in Christianity, this gets flipped. It's God loves you so much that he gives his son for you. It's, it's totally, totally reverses the paganism, but that didn't happen. That didn't happen in Islam. And so uh, it's just it's just this weird thing where people don't view themselves as sacrificing to gods anymore, but everyone's being required to offer up their children as as their as the evidence of their devotion to their cause, right? So he, you know, here in the U.S., you got to take your kid to a you know a drag queen story hour, because not because you've actually sat back and thought about it and said, you know, I think this is what is best for my kid. It's you're demonstrating your devotion to your group, which has become your god. In the U.K., I mean, they spent decades allowing these grooming gangs to rape and drug and pimp. 11 and 12 year old girls to show their devotion to how tolerant they are and how how anti-islamophobia they are and here you've got uh you, you've got muslims wanting their kids to go and be martyred for allah and they're they're showing their devotion by yeah, i want my kids to go out and and die for this and it's just this i don't know i find this fat it's 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 fascinating to me how situations change but human nature doesn't change in the sense that here we are thousands of years after these uh you know child sacrifice you had and it's still the same mentality i'm showing my my devotion to my group or my ideology by handing over my children that's a superb point very important and i think that we will end it there i do want to just add one other thing though very quickly a sermon out of iran friday sermon Nasir Hosseini, who is the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei's representative in several provinces, he uh, was telling people they have to go on the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. They have to do it. And he says, the prophet said that if a person is rich but does not perform the Hajj, he might die as a Jew. He says, there is such a Hadith. I haven't read that Hadith. It must be a Shiite Hadith. I don't know. Have you read that, David? Uh, I don't recall that, but I've, I've forgotten a lot of Hadiths over the yeah, years. there's so many. A person on his deathbed could die as a member of the Jewish religion. A person who is financially well-off and physically healthy and does not perform Hajj could be thrown out of Islam in the last moment he will die in the Jewish religion, as you see in the Hadith. So this anti-Semitism is so deep. It goes so far within Islamic tradition. It's astonishing. People have no idea. Anyway, David, thank you very much. Not a whole lot of jihad reporting this week, but I hope that you all found this an interesting conversation. Next week, I'm afraid there will be more jihad. Stay safe till then. Good evening, and God bless you.